Sirius XM and First Wave celebrate 40 years of The Cure. With the 4th of July, 4 for The Cure weekend. Hear four song blocks from The Cure every hour, all weekend long. Plus, special Cure editions of Lust for Lists and Dark Wave. Starts July 4th, 12 noon Eastern and throughout the weekend, exclusively on Sirius XM First Wave. Entertainment magazine editor and author Lori Majewski shares her lust for lists with you now. Hey, First Wavers, Lori Majewski here. Well, this today, we have a very special edition of Lust for Lists. This week, in honor of the 40th anniversary of The Cure, we have an all cure playlist. I've only ever done this once before with one other group. You guys may remember our All Eurythmics playlist, but I think when a band that we love turns 40, we kind of owe it to them to do this. And to help us reminisce, we have the man who back in 1978, wow, co-founded The Cure, Lowell Tolhurst. Hello, Lowell. How are you today? I, I'm very good, despite you making me feel very old. But, um. <laughs> well, it, you'll even nah. feel older when I remind yeah. you that it was 52 years ago that you first met Robert Smith. Yeah, wow, that, that, yeah, that's amazing, half a century. You know, he's probably the person I've known the longest in my life, if I think about it. You know? Well, Lowell, I read about your lifelong friendship with Robert in your excellent memoir, Cured, The Tale of Two Imaginary Boys. And you specifically came up with the name Easy Cure, which became yeah. The Cure. This begs the question, what did you see yourselves as The Cure for? Uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the, the 70s in England, you know, most of what was going on musically was either like disco or, or really sort of overblown, horrid prog rock. And that didn't, that wasn't really what resonated with us, you know. So we, we decided, well, we've got to get rid of it and we've got to make something different, you know. And, and punk had started to come up, you know. Like uh, I, I tell people that... Uh, you know, Joe Strummer kind of gave me the, the permission, you know, to, to start something, you know, not personally, but just, you know, listening to The Clash. And um, eventually we changed it to The Cure because it sounded more punky. The first song we played is Just Like Heaven. And for me, Just Like Heaven was the first time I saw The Cure on MTV. Because uh, MTV back then was in uh, a very tiny little studio in New York. It was about the size of somebody's living room. And there were only about six or eight videos coming out every week. So if they didn't play us, they wouldn't have anything to play. So that's how we got on. You know, it was like the luck of the draw, really. I mean, I think, you know, seriously, we had some, we had some interesting videos that didn't look like anybody else because we had Tim Pope. And, you know, we, we had the look which was a lot different it just sort of happily coincided at the same time you know well we're definitely going to get into that look a little bit later on let's get to the next song now here is the cure with plain song So you guys want to feel old? Think about this. The Cure is celebrating their 40th birthday this week. Robert Smith is playing a concert in London's Hyde Park to mark the occasion. And I've curated an all-Cure mixtape for you on this week's Lust for Lists. I'm Laurie Majewski, and it's a pleasure to be joined by Cure co-founder Lowell Tolhurst. Lowell, we just heard The Love Cats, which is one of the singles on the Cure compilation, Japanese Whispers. And if you remember, it followed the singles, Let's Go to Bed and The Walk. You know, I was wondering what your take is on that drastic musical departure, that crazy left hand turn that The Cure took after pornography. It really yeah. resulted in such a different sound that at first had fans up in arms. We like to do music. We like lots of different kinds of music. I mean, you know, look at it this way. Nobody expects a, a painter to repaint the same picture every time. And for us as musicians and people who loved music, you know, after we'd done something that was as um, intense and as emotional as pornography, and especially doing the tour after that, which was even more emotional, you know, things kind of fell apart for a while there. 
And then we got back together. It was just like myself and Robert. And we made something that was lighter because, you know, otherwise I think, you know, things would have kind of sort of uh, exploded, really. Well, next <laughs> we have another song about cats. And it's one that you were a big part of. I don't know if you realize this. All Cats Are Grey mm. is often in the top five of Cure mm. fans' favorite songs by the band. What well, can you tell me about that song? At the time, there was a lot of uh, stuff, you know, in, in uh, family lives, really. You know, Robert's grandmother passed away, my mother passed away. And so the lyrics, you know, came from... My mother told me this, this story about the Second World War, you know, because, you know, every night they had the blackout uh, while they were getting bombed. And so, you know, there was no lights around the, the city, you know, so it's very difficult to get around the city, you know, and people would say, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, because in, in, in the dark, it's all, everything looks the same, you know, and so that's where the idea comes from for the title. But then I thought, okay, well, you know, we were writing an album that was really, you know, at its basis for me uh, about, you know, about what it, what the title is, faith, you know, and, and how you go from, uh, you know, what you grew up with to what you believe as you get older. Mm-hmm. Well, here's a song that um, it just wouldn't have worked if it were All Cats Are White or All Cats Are Calico. <laughs> All Cats Are Grey, The Cure. You're listening to First Wave. I'm Lori Majewski, and this is my show, Lust for Lists. And that was The Cure. And all the songs we're playing today are from The Cure because it's The Cure's 40th birthday. Cure (laughs) co-founder. Yay, happy birthday, Cure. Um, We have with us today Cure co-founder Lowell Tolhurst, lifelong friend of Robert Smith and author of a beautifully written memoir, Cured. Here's a question for you, Lowell. We just heard In Between Days, which is one of the very first Cure videos I ever saw. And um, right. I have a question about the videos. The Cure had a longstanding creative mm. partnership with the director, Tim Pope, who made you guys mm. do some really crazy things. He, he crammed you into a wardrobe <laughs> as it filled with water for Close to Me. Yeah. You, he made you dress yeah. in crazy, cumbersome outfits, costumes for Why Can't I Be You? You know. Right. Was this running theme of absurdity something that you tried to top with each video? Be- oh, it was it just there because it, it had a clash, you know, juxtaposed with the darkness of the cure? Like, tell me about y- what you think of the videos. Well, me personally, you know, I loved him. I think he was like for us meeting him was the first time we'd met somebody who could accurately translate how we were in reality as people. Uh, in, into something visually to look at, you know, in the video. Uh, we'd had done some videos before, but, you know, no offense to the previous people that we'd worked with, but the, it, it really didn't uh, reflect who we were completely, we felt. The next song is from the Cure album, Pornography, The Hanging Garden. What is this album and, and what does what does this song in particular, what kind of memories does it bring back for you? Well, for me personally, for the Hang Garden, because, you know, it's a very uh, sort of intense song to play drum-wise, uh, you know, it, it has it has memories of the first time we ever played it live, and luckily we hadn't recorded it by this time, and so nobody knew that it, it wasn't really supposed to slow down in the middle and start <laughs> up again, you know, because it was, it was kind of hard for me to get my, you know, my body to do the things, you know, drumming, drumming, I always tell people, is like dancing, you know, if you do it right, you could dance all night, but uh, if you do it wrong, then it's it's really like running a bad marathon or something. So let's hear the original now. Here's The Hanging Garden, The Cure. Fascination Street, the first American single off of what is often cited as the greatest alternative rock album of all time, Disintegration by The Cure. I'm Lori Majewski, and you're listening to my All Cure playlist and special guest, Lowell Tolhurst, who is co-founder of The Cure. We wouldn't have this playlist if not for you, Lowell. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Lowell, Disintegration. We right. just came in, widely considered a masterpiece, but the first time you heard it, you didn't love it. And mm. voicing your opinion <laughs> to Robert Smith... Yeah. 
yeah. probably cost you your place in, in the band that you founded, that you co-founded. Can, can you talk yeah. about a little bit about why you weren't a fan of this in the beginning? You know, I, I think it, in some ways, uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight and having, you know, quite a few years between those events and now, I can, I can see things a lot, a lot clearer. Most of what was going on at the time in my head about it wasn't really anything to do with the music. It wasn't anything to do with the, 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 you know, the actual album because I've since listened to Disintegration you know, many times and I really, I really love it. I really think that it's you know, the best version of, of that version of The Cure, absolutely. But, you know, at the time when, when all of that was going on, I wasn't uh, in the best place mentally. You know, I, I, was, I was suffering. I mean, let's say it out loud, I was suffering from alcoholism and I was, you know, it took me, you know, a few years after that to get into recovery. So most of what was going on in my head as, you know, I was listening to the, the final mixes was not, you know, whether it was good or bad. It was whether or not I had actually been able to add anything to it and you know the horrible realization as it was playing back was yeah you know there's not a tremendous amount of of me or anything that i could give to the 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 work in there and one of the things i was always very concerned with always very you know something i really wanted to do was was to be part of making whatever we made so that's the reason you know i went from drums to keyboards because it didn't matter to me what i played it mattered to me how i added to to what we did and and so you know if there needed to be a lyric here i'd write a lyric if there needed to be something here i would do that you know musically whatever whatever i could do now here's the cure primary Charlotte, sometimes, how much do I love that song? I'm Laurie Majewski, and you're listening to First Wave and my show, Lust for Lists. And today, we have a very special guest, Lowell Tolhurst, who is an important part of every single song that you're hearing on today's All Cure playlist. Lol, let's talk about something that's almost as identifiable as The Cure's music, and that is your look. You know, when you think back to all of the most iconic looks, you know, you think of David Bowie with like, you know, the the lightning bolt across his face. The Cure's makeup and the smeared eyeliner and the smeared lipstick, that has become like just super it's it's a visual that you can't get out of your mind when you think about the cure can you take us back to the beginnings of that like how did that come about did you actually talk about it i think back then we wouldn't have talked to each other really about oh let's do this now let's let's do this kind of thing i think if i if i remember correctly most of the stuff with the hair and the makeup sort of started out gradually, little by little, and it was influenced by many things. You know, there was that point where we were on the road with Susie and, and her banshees, you know, and she's a very striking person in lots of ways, a very lovely person. And, you know, we, we looked at different things, different aspects, you know, and you gradually assimilate stuff. You know, I think that was always what, what Bowie did more than anything else. You know, I don't really think of Bowie as as somebody who who made things completely original. I think he was a synthesis of a lot of uh, different things. You know, and we had stuff... I mean, I remember Robert talking about, oh, you know, uh, 17th century, you know, romantic French poets, and they all had hair that looks like Robert's hair, you know? So after a while, we sort of incorporated various bits, and, you know, the smeared lipstick. I think the lipstick was, was on sort of nicely, and then Robert walked up to the mic and... It sort of got hit and smeared across his face. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, let's move on to another Cure song. Here's Catch. Sometimes even try to catch her, but never even call her name. Thank you 
so much for listening to First Wave and to my show, Lust for Lists, this week. If you love The Cure, if you're just a cursory fan of The Cure, you cannot deny all of these songs. And if you haven't had enough, there's going to be three more hours on Dark Wave. Thank you so much, Lol, for joining me today. I just love listening to your stories. And the, and the next song <laughs> that we're going to be playing is Boys Don't Cry. And think about it. When yeah. I think of girls on film, Boys Don't Cry, like yeah. these song titles have gone on to become yeah. you know, ubiquitous like movie titles, yeah. headlines for magazine articles. But what yeah. did Boys Don't Cry mean to you when you guys put it out? For Robert, I think it was you know, a chance to show that, hey, I can write, you know, I can write a pop song. And, you know, maybe it's it's like the precursor to the stuff that The Cure became famous for. Because what I really think, you know, is the, the Cure's lasting legacy is that at the point where we came out, rock music, for want of a better word, was, was very you know, macho. And, and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very sympathetic to, you know, pale young men with, you know, wearing their hearts on their sleeves. And I think if there's one thing that the the cure did that made possible was for it to be okay to be you know a young man, be an intense young man, but also have have some some feelings that weren't you know not just to be full of bravado all the time, but actually to show people who you who you were. And you know, obviously that works for for girls as well. But so for boys, don't cry for me. You know, obviously it's a song about boys that do cry. It's the start. You know the, the the little germ of of where the seed of where that came from, and you know so that in that way it's it's very important. You know it's interesting. You just encapsulated there why I love the music I do and why I love boys who love the music that I do. Right. right. <laughs> um, before I let you go, I have to ask you about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The Cure has been right. nominated, and so far has not gone in. But what does that mean to you? You know, there are people from who are your contemporaries who say, yeah. oh, we don't really care about the Rock Hall. But, you know, it means yeah. a lot to the fans. What does it mean to you personally? I think you have actually encapsulated how I feel about it in in your preamble there. That I think to the fans, it, it would be vindication, you know, because uh, they know what we've done and where we've been. And, and, you know, that that's something that would be, you know, correct. For me, myself, I'm a bit like, what was the, the quote that uh, Groucho Marx used to say? I, I wouldn't want to be a member of any club that would have me as a member. <laughs> That's really, you know, and I, I don't want to speak for Robert. I think he might agree with that. Hmm. Well, don't forget that David Bowie famously did not show up when he was put mm. into the Rock Hall. And uh, uh, I think that says a lot. Well, I think it says everything, really, doesn't it? Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And um, is there anything you want to tell your fans, Lol, before we go? Well, I think mainly, you know, after after 40 years, we've, we've probably said everything that we need to say to each other. But you know what? I still love them all. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Have a good week, everybody. Time before his time